Hi everyone, so I'm Ricardo, I'm a computing engineer in the CERN IT department. Uh, hi there, I'm Clenimar, I'm actually a software engineer at the Federal University of Campina Grande in Brazil, where I'm also doing my master's, and last year I had the opportunity to work at CERN at the cloud team. So, yeah, so today we'll talk about a bit about CERN and what, what, why we have heavy needs on computing, but also how we've been using Kubernetes to try to expand uh, our resources in-house. Uh, so a bit about CERN. So CERN is the European Organization for Nuclear Research. It was founded in 1954, uh, with its main goal being fundamental science. And we try, over these decades, we've been trying to answer some of the big questions uh, in science. Uh, some are like, what is 96% of the universe made of? We only really understand 4%, and we've been trying to see what is dark energy and dark matter. Uh, what was the state of the matter just after the Big Bang, something called the quark gluon plasma? And why isn't there any antimatter in the universe? We know, in theoretically, we should have the same amounts of matter and antimatter, so we keep searching why we don't see any antimatter around. So CERN is located in Geneva, Switzerland. Uh, it's actually across the French-Swiss border, so you can see the white uh, dotted line there. It's the, the border between France uh, and Switzerland. Uh, it's very close to Lake Geneva, you can see there, and uh, very close to the European Northern Alps also. So you can see the back, on the background there the European Northern Alps with the Mont Blanc in the, in the middle, which makes for a really nice background in our cafeteria. Um, <laughs> so to have an idea of the size, uh, the, the part in the middle there is the runway of the Geneva Airport. Uh, we have two sites, the, the main one being in Mérin, uh, which you can see there. Um, and that's where we host the first of our machines. So uh, we have a complex set of accelerators. Uh, the first one is the, it's called the PS, where we inject uh, beams of protons. So we accelerate them first in this uh, small accelerator. As they get stable and faster, we put them in the SPS, which is already seven kilometers in circumference. And when they are stable there, we actually inject them into the Large Hadron Collider, which is our uh, main machine right now. We inject two beams of protons in opposite directions and we accelerate them to the speed of light, or close to the speed of light. Um, and once they are stable, we make them collide, these two beams, in precise places where we've built uh, massive uh, particle physics experiments. Uh, you can see their names there, the four main ones, uh, CMS and ATLAS, which main goal is to, was to find the Higgs boson and to understand better its characteristics. They do a lot of other physics too. And then we have ALICE and LHCB. So this, these are uh, our main uh, machines right now. Uh, this is a view of the uh, accelerator itself, the Large Hydro Collider. It's actually 100 meters underground. Um, you can see the magnets here. These are superconducting mag magnets so that we can um, accelerate them to these higher energies, uh, which means are, the accelerator is also very cold. So uh, it's uh, at 1.9 Kelvin, which is very close to the absolute zero, something like minus 271 uh, degrees Celsius. Uh, you can see also that we can walk around if we need to do interventions. Of course, when it's operating, the access is quite restricted uh, and we can just go. But if you pass by CERN or close by in a time where you have a technical shutdown or an upgrade, you can actually go down and visit. We organize uh, regular visits for it. Now, the collisions themselves happen in caverns, also underground, where we have uh, instruments like this one. This is the compact muon sol solenoid, the CMS detector. It's not very compact. Uh, it uh, weighs 14,000 tons, and it's 20 meters long and 50 meters <laughs> wide, so it's quite a big machine. You can see the people there to have an idea of the scale. Once it's operating, we close it, and we do the collisions there. So. Uh, you can see all these layers of detectors that will try to track the energies and the particles being generated. Uh, it's kind of like a big camera for very, very small uh, um, mass. So uh, it's our modern cameras for, for doing physics. Uh, we have other experiments on site, apart from the ones related to the Large Hadron Collider. So here I have a picture of the antimatter factory. So we keep our own antimatter factory just down the road from the office, so, as you do, and uh, it's actually across the restaurant also. So here we try to create antimatter and to understand better its characteristics. Uh, the other experiment I put here is the AMS experiment. Um, so in this case, it's not actually at CERN, it's in the International Space Station. So it's, it was sent there along the penultimate uh, uh, space shuttle mission, and we had the, the crew of this uh, mission coming to CERN explaining about life in space and how it was to install it. You can see where it is in the ISS, so there's an arrow there, uh, so that's where we are. And uh, 
The goal is to, to try to detect or measure uh, antimatter in cosmic rays. That's why it's outside the Earth's uh, atmosphere to have less noise there. Now, why we are here is because we do a lot of computing and we have a big computing requirements. Um, you can see here uh, all starts in the, these detectors where we do the collisions. In total, we can do something like a billion collisions per second. Uh, the rate of data generation is, is huge, so we can generate something like a petabyte a second, which is not something we can manage at all. So what we do is we have two main filters directly after the collisions uh, inside the detector, or very close to the detector, where we do the first level filtering. Uh, we can reduce with these two triggers, uh, we can reduce to something like 1 to 10 gigabytes a second, which is something we can manage right now. So we store all of this uh, into our data centers. Actually, we store it on tape for, for archival. And from then on, we start all the reprocessing and analyzing of all the data. Uh, so for this, we have a big uh, computer center in Mera, in Geneva. Uh, this is the first floor. It has another ground floor. We actually have a second data center in, in, um, in close to Budapest, uh, linked to this one. Um, it's a historical building. It's been there for over f or around 50 years. Uh, and if you visit, you can see the pictures of the evolution of computing itself uh, by just looking at how this data center has changed from mainframes, people walking around to now just traditional racks. Uh, there's also the internet backbone on the back, the yellow part uh, that we still keep, and it's still relevant in the region. Um, our capacity, so this is a, we have a big OpenStack cloud deployed here, and we have something like 320,000 cores uh, available. Uh, oh, we do mostly virtualized resources right now, so it's over 10,000 hypervisors. We store something like 250 petabytes of data right now. We add 60 to 7 petabytes every, every year uh, with the accelerator running. Uh, we have over 4,000 projects, 3,000 users. And the, big, the main thing here for, for this talk is that we already have more than 200 uh, Kubernetes clusters. These clusters uh, span from small clusters, like 10 nodes, to a couple of hundred nodes. The biggest ones we have are around a thousand nodes. And we do many things, continuous integration and deployment. Uh, we also do uh, integration for data analysis with things like Spark. So there's, uh, we just give an interface for people to, to spawn their Kubernetes clusters and we help them do their workloads. Uh, even with those resources, we don't have enough to process the LHC data. So over the last two decades, we set up a, distributed, a large distributed computing infrastructure where we linked over 200 sites around the world with CERN being the tier zero, uh, where the data is kept originally. And then we have a set of big tier ones uh, split around, uh, around the world, where we push initially the data and we start the reconstruction there. And then we linked a couple of hundred sites uh, from small computer centers and uh, universities that help us and provide the, us with their computing power uh, to do the reconstruction, the calibration of the detector, simulation data, and, and the analysis. Um, at any moment, we run something like 400,000 jobs in, in parallel in this infrastructure, and uh, we provide over 700,000 cores. Now, the end result of all of this, all of this uh, infrastructure, uh, complex accelerators computing, is to reach uh, these kind of plots. Uh, so on the top left, we see uh, the Higgs event, so when it was first uh, uh, found in our detectors. And this is a, a, a shot from the CMS detector in May 2012, uh, at a reconstru reconstruction of a Higgs event in the CMS detector. On the lower right side, we have this, a similar event from the Atlas uh, experiment. Now, all of this infrastructure, all we want to see is these red spikes, which corresponds to a new physics, new particle, something that we had never observed before. So they, it, this is what we look for. Um, so uh, let's talk Kubernetes and Federation. So here you can see uh, a few reasons why a Kubernetes Federation could, uh, would be useful uh, to us. So first of all, as you may have noticed, uh, CERN has a large uh, computing infrastructure, but still at some points of the year we can notice uh, uh, load spikes, so even more resources are needed, especially before big physics conferences or during large uh, reconstruction campaigns from the experiments. So a federation would allow us to uh, easily add more uh, resources to, to the infrastructure by creating new clusters that they could be also in external clouds, and then we can add them to the infrastructure through a single entry point, and then 
to, to supply the, this temporary need. Also, um, as Kubernetes has well-defined ways to do monitoring, life cycle, and alarms, uh, it, ma it makes life uh, pretty easier, and it, it also got a lot of tools that integrate seamlessly with the infrastructure, like Prometheus, and we like to uh, experiment more and more with those tools. And uh, by providing a uniform API, uh, it, it allows us to define and run applications inside CERN. And using the same definitions, we can do that uh, outside CERN, because we're talking about the same API, so we're talking about the same resources and objects. So we prepared two use cases regarding federation at CERN for you. Uh, the first one is the CERN batch system, which is actually, it actually, it actually corresponds to 80% approximately of the whole computing uh, power of CERN, and it actually runs the workloads uh, to, that runs the analysis from the LHC data. And also the recast analysis, which is a new tool. It's, it's based on cloud native concepts. And it allows physicists to, to run reusable analysis and physics data. So let's just start with the, the batch system. It is based on HT Condor, and CERN has uh, many decades of experience with that. So it basically works like this. A user, when defining a new workload, they advertise requests. So they let the system know uh, the amount of resources that that specific workload needs in order to, to run properly. And then on the other side, we have the resources that are actually the compute nodes that also advertise their capabilities to the system. So they can tell the system the, the total amount of resources that they have. Then there's a collector component that collects those advertisements. We call them class ads. And then it gives them to a negotiator component which does the matchmaking job. It's basically binding a requests to resources that are able to, to supply those requests. It's basically binding workloads to a set of nodes that are capable of running those workloads. It's got also some advanced features, like uh, it supports fair share and preemption, so we can have uh, priority, for example, you can stop a low priority job to, to free up resources to a more important one that just arrived. And it's, uh, as I mentioned before, it takes approximately 80% of the certain computing capacity, and most of it running virtualized. So, for example, it would be good in the future to move bare metal, for example, so we, we would gain some performance just by skipping the virtualization bits in the middle of it. Uh, also, it's important to notice here that HT Condor just handles the computing part. So for networking and storage, it actually relies on uh, certain services that already exist. So the computing part of it is the start D daemon, which is represented here. Uh, and it runs on every node of the batch system. It, it's actually the responsible for running the workload uh, on the node. So we containerized it. We containerized it, and once you have it, this container, uh, we can run it at that scale. So uh, why not a federation to try it, right? So we have this experiment. This was actually my internship project last year uh, when, when I was at CERN. And we have this host cluster, which is responsible for running the controller manager for the federation and also the federated API server for Kubernetes. Then we deploy the control plane components uh, for HT Condor, the, the scheduler, the collector, and the negotiator. And then we are able to start our federation by, by running a simple command, which is the kubefed init. Once we run it, uh, we have a federation set up, and you, you can start um, playing with it. So here you can see, I'm really having trouble with this. OK, here you can see at the top right corner uh, a resource definition. It's a daemon set. And what it actually does, it describes uh, our start D container. So as you know, a daemon set, the Kubernetes control plane, we make sure that every single node in the cluster runs a replica of it. So we're basically turning the, the, the nodes into HT Condor nodes that are able to run actual uh, workloads, actual production workloads which is pretty cool because you have a single resource. And as you deploy that and the federated level, uh, the control plane to make sure that every single node in all the underlying clusters 
we'll have uh, this replica running. So we deployed a couple clusters. We deployed a couple at CERN, but we also went uh, to external clouds. We deployed a couple clusters in T systems, and we also experimented with GKE, AWS, and Azure. So to join those clusters, we just need to run a single command. Again, it's kubefed join. And once we do that, uh, the control plane will make sure that those new nodes that were just added will have the, the replica of the, the daemon running too. So it's pretty, it's, it's pretty cool. You can imagine, for example, that CERN receives a new hardware, and then you've got those new machines, and then you wonder, how can I uh, integrate that with the production infrastructure? That's pretty tricky, but if you have a federation, you, you just need to deploy a cluster with those new resources and join them uh, to the federation. So in really short time, they will be able to run actual production workloads and uh, help CERN make uh, new physics. Cool. So I'll take for the second use case. So the, 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 this was the first use case we took, which is taking a well-established application at CERN and seeing how we could explore Kubernetes to, to allow us to expand our data center to the outside. So yesterday, we got together with uh, Lukash also, and uh, we were playing what we call public cloud bingo, just adding as many public clouds as we can to the federation and see how it works. So we got, we got to seven yesterday, so it was a record. Uh, now, the second, the second example I'll give is something, uh, it's a new application where we don't have to rely on, on legacy systems. We can just design it from scratch, uh, uh, taking advantage of the new cloud native uh, uh, definitions. So this is a, a tool that aims to, to allow physicists to reuse their analysis. One of the problems we have is that analysis in physics is quite complex to, to define and, and run. So with this system, people will uh, define what their analysis look like as a workflow, which we see on the picture there, and then they will submit it, and uh, they will be able to also share with a link and uh, a nice uh, inventory uh, with their colleagues so that they can reproduce the same analysis or do it with some other uh, data. Now, the, the cool thing here is that as it's defined as a workflow, the system takes each step and defines it as a Kubernetes job. And we started by, doing, by running uh, with our colleagues um, in, a, in a single cluster, but actually we saw that we could also explore a uh, federation uh, for, for this use case. And this is actually the, the best use case we have uh, right now for federation. So we'll, we'll play a quick demo uh, of how this works. Um, so there we go. So here we have the, how the system works, and we have some preset examples where we can do some Higgs analysis, uh, dark matter supersymmetry. So in this case, we'll choose the Higgs analysis. Uh, we can parameterize the analysis with some input data and how we want to see the output. And this registers the workflow in the system. So the workflow will start uh, almost immediately. The first step of the workflow is to uh, define how, how the different jobs should be run. And this is running on the host cluster in this case. We can see here that we have the federation control plane on the top. And then we have three clusters that are registered in the system. In this case, it was two at CERN and one in a public cloud in two systems. Um, so the, the three clusters are ready. The workflow is starting to build the jobs. And eventually, we can see how the workflow uh, is. We have the physics data on the left. On the middle, we have the computation of uh, using the standard model of physics. And on the right, we have the, si the new signal that we want to see if, it, if it's new physics or if it corresponds to, to existing and known physics. So the workflow is quite complex. It has a lot of jobs. Uh, we wanted initially to do a live demo, but uh, it actually takes too long to run. Uh, but one cool feature is that we can also explore things like the log collection, centralized log collection, to give feedback to the user immediately of how their jobs are going. So here we see that a, a job in the Federation Cloud Control Plane corresponds to a job on the, one of the clusters, and you will see how it goes. We accelerate the analysis a bit here, uh, many, many times, so that we can play it uh, uh, live here, or not live, but recorded. And then from time to time, you will see the feedback on how your workflow is going, which is a cool a way that we didn't have an easy way to do this before. Uh, eventually, we'll get to a point where all the jobs are executed and uh, we get uh, our job finished. Uh, the output, in this case, we had chosen to generate a plot. As I mentioned, uh, very often the result of a physics analysis is just a plot, um, but this plot gives us a, a lot of information. So in this case, we actually generated two plots and uh, so the end result of, uh, of our tasks uh, looks like this. So we can see the standard model data in the three lower layers, and the new signal, it's this uh, green part. Uh, so this is what we do, basically. We have all this com computing infrastructure to reach uh, uh, this, this, uh, this point. 
So going back to the slides, uh, we just want to thank everyone, actually, so especially the CERN uh, OpenStack Cloud team for helping us with the infrastructure. Lucas Anrich, which is the, the author of this recast tool, and he's also around here, so if you're interested in workflows and how we are running them in Kubernetes, uh, make sure you talk to him, and also Kelsey for, for going through the content of the pre uh, presentation. But mo mostly thank you, everyone, for, for doing some really cool uh, tools, uh, Kubernetes and all the related projects in the Cloud Native Foundation. Uh, I've been developing distributed systems for many, many years, and this has made my life much easier, less code to maintain, and uh, focusing really on the, on the physics that uh, is what we want to do at CERN. So thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks.